They do not tell you how very selective this justice is. Less than 1% of all the people killed. And then the pattern's really clear. Overwhelmingly, it's when white people get killed. 80% of all the people on death row in the death penalty sought, it's because they had white victims. When victims of color, hardly a blip on the radar screen. And over 50% of all homicide victims are people of color. So you have a selectivity when you feel the outrage, when you're going to go for the ultimate penalty. That's so clear in the practice of the death penalty. One is, first of all, the people by and large are unengaged in the issue. So when a, there's been a terrible crime and a person comes up for execution. The other thing is that it's a secret ritual. They never see a human being being brought and killed in front of their eyes. They never see that. It's, and then I think that's by design. And then the other thing is politicians have such an easy symbol when they're running for office and they utilize it. I'm really tough on crime. I'm for the death penalty. Now, they're not going to tell you that out of 15,000 homicides in this country every year, less than 1% of all the people who murder other people are selected in this lottery system. They're not going to get into that with you. They're just going to simply give out their simplistic solution. I'm really tough on crime. I believe in biting a bullet and being for the death penalty. But it's no solution. We need to be smart. One of the factors now that's beginning to remove the death penalty is first, there have been so many innocent people, people found innocent. 141 have been exonerated off a of death row in the United States because college volunteers got involved in the case. College volunteers, how's that for a court system? What they can do with the money they save is they can work on cold cases. What about those victims' families out there that have had a loved one murdered and they don't know who did it and it remains unsolved? They can also put some of the funds into helping victims' families, really helping them heal, helping them with counseling, helping them with jobs, helping the siblings of, of you know, one of the children was murdered and what happens to the brothers and sisters? So the money, the resources can go into life and then into community policing, into working with at-risk kids who might be the ones who are on this, you know, this uh, skid in their life and most prone to violence. What if you intervene in those kids' lives early enough to save the community from violence? That's the road we need to start going down. People are hungry for nonviolence. They are. They, they know that we can't keep going down the path that we're pursuing. They've seen the war in Afghanistan. They've seen the war in, in Iraq. They see violence being used as a solution, and where are we at the end of it, you know? And I think it's because people are good and people are decent. If you can wake them up, if you can get them to think about it, it's not really that hard. So that's my job. I'm a Southern storyteller. I'm not so much a lecturer, but I tell them the story of Dead Man Walking. I take them with me on my journey of not knowing much about the social issues at all, just praying for people like a good nun. And then I got in and rolled up my sleeves and got involved with people. And then I began to experience life from a whole different perspective.